This time on Norfolk for Perspectives, we're talking about the future direction of floodplain management and the role you can play. Our post, Norfolk Senior Olympics, I think there's a recruitment thing going on here. And Faith Inclusion Network, a super program that you're going to want to hear about. Stay tuned for some great stuff right here on Norfolk Perspectives. Welcome to Norfolk Perspectives. I'm Bob Batcher. Well, you know, you keep hearing in the news that uh, we're sinking and the sea is rising, and I got the expert here to talk about that. Robert Tahan, how you doing? I'm good, Bob. How are you? Pretty good. Now, Bob, you're in the planning department, and to be honest with you, when we came up with this topic, I thought I'd get one of those civil engineers, aquatic engineers, or whatever. What role do you play as a planner in all this? Well, I manage the floodplain management with the zoning administrator, Lenny Newcomb, and we enforce the city code regulations or the zoning ordinance regulations on how the floodplain affects the city and how you can build in the city. Okay, so public works will build it once the, in the public structures. But really, there's a coming together of the private sector, and it's not just in building roads, right? That's correct. You know, we talk about uh, w when it comes to the zoning ordinance regulations, it's about... Uh, protecting the citizens and their and their property, and how what we can do uh, in the regulations in order to protect their property. Okay, because I know there's that tug of war of people saying oh, it's a f free country. I should be able to do whatever I want to do. And sometimes you go to communities that have that rule, and you can tell. Right, and, that, and that's correct. And and the hard part is now is that you know I've grown up in this area my whole life, and all I know now is that the water's coming more often. It's flooding more often, and we need to do something to protect it. And people are slowly turning around and saying, you know, yes, we understand that, and we need to do what, what's best to protect our city. So when you go to Ocean View or parts of our community and you see a quadplex on concrete slab that's now 75 feet from the water, and you ask, how'd they happen to build that? Uh, those were built in the previous regulations. Some of them were actually built before there were any regulations that uh, regulate anything near the water and the floodplain. So, uh, you know, the city joined the uh, National Flood Insurance Program uh, in the 1970s and the regulations that came along with that. So. Okay, so, the, and that's what you're trying to prevent then is that 50 years from now, we're not going through an area saying, why did they build that? Right, and that's, and why is it always flooding also? Okay, so through the general plan, through zoning, we can kind of set that direction then? Correct. Now, where does the citizen come into play? Well, that's, that's the great part about it, you know, the city as a whole isn't just doing, aren't just doing things to protect the city just by enforcing regulations. We're also looking to uh, do certain things to protect us with structures. You know, Public Works is looking into protecting the city, and the citizens have an opportunity to come in and talk with, with that group of people that, is, that are in charge of uh, coming up with those rules and regulations and, and trying to find things to protect the city. Uh, quarterly, the city meets with citizens and we give them updates on everything that we're doing and uh, they have a chance to give their input also. Okay, now I, throughout this whole conversation, and what's really been cool is over the last couple of years, we've really sort of put coming together in a strategic manner. Is that what we mean by uh, when I, you know, the future direction of a floodplain management is taking it strategically? Yes, uh, the key is that we need to look at the city as a whole and what we're going to do to protect it. Um, strategically planning, not just, again, not just what the citizens do with their property, but also what the city does to protect uh, property and protect the city's infrastructure and critical facilities. Okay, now I know that for a long time there was some wringing of hands saying, well, there's no money, look at this, look at the economy, and it's all very expensive propositions to fix. So there's nothing we can do. What changed? Well, the city has taken a lead role in, uh, in trying to come up and come forward and say, we are important to, to the United States. Uh, we have the world's largest Navy base, and it needs to be protected. And our facilities need to be protected, uh, and we need the money to do it. And, you know, our mayor has been out there and has been on public mm -hmm. radio out saying that we need the funds in order to protect our city. Now, Bob, i got to tell you, on the way to work, I drive down Llewellyn, and there's that infamous dip. And it's like, okay, it's high tide, it floods, why can't they just raise the road? You know, that's the hard part. People want us just to raise the roads to protect the cars. But in my opinion, and what we believe is that the best way is to protect your property. Um, 
the drain, normal drainage pattern from the from the old days is to put all the water into the street and let it get to get to the places where it can go. Um, you know. If we raise the roads, it's going to put the water onto your property, and that's something that we most definitely don't want. You know, I, I started off by talking about what the citizen can do, and I know that we were witness to a meeting where we had a, 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 a national politician come in and he thought he had the answers, and there was a large crowd of citizens there who really were impactful in changing his direction. So there is a place that the citizen can that's right. You know, they, they need to be able to be informed, to understand what's going on. Uh, the city has a website at, at Norfolk.gov. It's our flood awareness website. And you can find out all the information that the city's, uh, of what the city's doing and what we're doing to try to not only just protect them, but protect the city as a whole. And being better informed lets them be able to do that part that, that the city can continue to do, but talk to their elected officials and say, please help us. Give us, give us the funds that we need. Because I mean, when you hear stories of somebody saying, you know, I, my house has been flooded three times in the last 10 years, I mean, there is recourse for them, right? Uh, that is correct. You know, we, we currently have uh, uh, the Office of Emergency Management that's working to try to get people grants in order to protect their homes. Uh, one way to do that is our grants to raise the houses so that, sure, the the crawl space may get wet, but the actual contents of the home and the finished floor, the, the, the living space of the home is protected. There are also other grants that are available that will that they can get to hopefully do things around their property to protect it to keep the water out too. I was going to say that same place where I see on Llewellyn, I, I've seen uh, some new shoreline shoring up, and it's not a matter of building the bulkhead, but really doing something between a, a riprap and, and grasses. So. That, that's correct. You know, our, our wetlands... Um, group uh, in environmental services in the planning department has been taking a very active role in trying to go towards uh, promoting this living shoreline in order to better protect uh, property. Um, normally people like to do a hardened uh, shoreline where they just put their bulkhead up and think they can keep the water out. Right. And, but you know, it, it's time and time again that we can see that these living shorelines that they're continuously working to try to, to, to install and to grow and to impact on people. Uh, as, as better protection. Now, uh, we haven't talked about the consultant, but I think this is kind of an irony of ironies. I mean, here we are. We're the second uh, largest city potential for flooding. Right. Uh, do, and we've got a consultant who kind of has some good experience with flooding. Doesn't That's it? correct. Public Works is, uh, has contracted Frugro, uh, which is a group from the Netherlands that has, uh, has history in trying to come up with ways to protect uh, cities and, and other localities. Uh, from the flooding and they're currently working on multiple studies uh, that we're looking to use to help us get funds to show what mm -hmm. we need to do to protect the city. Again, that's part of that changing of the way we look at a situation. Instead of focusing solely on the problem, let's focus on the solution and that's one of those where there's no way we could afford that. Well, maybe by getting people involved in a different level we can start opening up those doors. Right? Yeah, that's most definitely true. That's, that's why we need to continue to, to ask for help ask for assistance and continue to go out there and, and tell them that we, that this is important and that we we are taking it very seriously. Now, you can go online our our site norfolk.gov. Correct. You look flooding or what? No, it's a, actually if you look at the top left-hand side right above the mayor's face, um, the there is a, a tab for the flood awareness uh, page, and in there you'll find uh, flood surge maps, um, hurricane maps, you'll find some of the studies that are actually out there for the that uh, Fugro has done and, and another consultant that we have that's reviewing our rainfall and also stuff on flood insurance. Okay. Thanks a lot, Bob. I, I'm, I'm kind of glad you brought it to my attention that we have flooding above the mayor's face. <laughs> Thanks a lot. When we come back, we're going to see if I can hold off being recruited for the Senior Olympics. I think I'm too young. What do you think? Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Norfolk Perspectives. Well, I, I've got Marie Barner on to talk about Senior Olympics, but she's going to, you're not going to try to recruit me, are you? <laughs> of course. I'm not old enough. <laughs> sure you are. What's a, okay, so what's a senior? 50 and better for the Senior Olympics. Oh. Yep. Do you qualify? 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. You got some sedentary stuff? <laughs> we do. We have some games, some table games, dominoes, checkers, uh, Texas Hold'em. We have some activities like okay. that. Okay. Now, okay, I, I'm a little confused this year because every year we've promoted this and I've been doing the show. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been getting older, and the participants <laughs> are getting younger. But but normally you've got somebody on here who's just laden down with you know 25 gold medals. They can't get off the sofa because they're so. Heavy. Where <laughs> are they today? Well, they're probably practicing. Probably practicing so for the game. You're so. just going to come in and hit me <laughs> just solo. Got me. Huh? Just got me. Today. Okay. Just got me. Why the? Let's talk senior Olympics. Why? What's the big to do of the senior Olympics? It's going to be. May 6th through May 9th. Right, right. And this is actually our 30th anniversary of doing the Norfolk Senior Olympics. 30th? Yep, 30 years. And you've got a couple or several who've been doing them all. Right, we have years. a couple of participants as well as some committee members as well that have been through every single year. Wait a minute, we're not doing the math. 50? <laughs> yeah, we do, we do. I think our oldest participant last year was in her 90s, 99. So. What did she do? Uh, well, they'll do the track. Sometimes they'll do the walk. Um, and then they'll do those sedentary activities. Some of them still uh, play pool. They bowl. Bowling is one of them as well. We even had a gentleman that was over 80 that participated in tennis. So, yeah, they're still active. That is so cool. Mm -hmm. Because it's not a matter of, it's, it's a matter of staying active. Mm -hmm. But it also is an opportunity for some people to get active, right? Yes, it is. It is. And at our senior centers, we promote that throughout the whole year about staying active and getting healthy. And we always promote that healthy lifestyle. So we want to kind of showcase their talents of what they've been doing all along all the years, um, whether it be those games that they're playing or even if it's in the sports activities like track and field and swimming and tennis. So it's a chance for them to showcase what they've learned or what they've been doing. And some of them have just been doing it for years and never stopped. So, Well, I've always said I've got great knees because I've never challenged them. <laughs> but that's going to catch up with me. What, not challenging them? Not challenging the knees, <laughs> Probably, right? probably. I know. And my mom commented once before that, you know, your body starts falling apart when you're 60. <laughs> but it's because of what you did, did or didn't do to it before you were 60. Right, right. I guess it's different for everybody, though. Because we have some 80-year-olds uh, uh, that are in the swimming pool and probably could run laps, swim laps around me, so... Really? <laughs> Definitely. I, you know, I, I remember back when I was in my 20s, I was living in Atlanta, and there was this 54-year-old who was, started running marathons four years earlier. And I kind of always used him as my, uh, <laughs> my milestone. <laughs> you know, he, and then I realized, I woke up one morning and said, ooh, I missed it. <laughs> I mean, it's never too late. It's never too late. Yeah, don't we kind of sometimes get trapped up in living for tomorrows? You do. You do. So what yeah. do you tell that person that you know they're just sitting in the chair and they need to get out? Well, it's not going to happen until you get up and do it. So, I mean, don't, don't wait on somebody else to do it or wait on that reason. It's got to come from within. You have to be able to do it. And it helps if you have somebody else that's going to do it with you, too. Gotcha. So kind of, and that's one of the reasons for kind of encouraging people to come to the centers. Right, right. And they get that camaraderie with getting to know other seniors, getting them out and about, um, introducing them, them to new things. So. A little competitive? It can be. Very let's talk about you. Because, <laughs> I mean, you've been active from the get-go. Yes. I haven't been in the Olympics, but I've been active. No, not in the, the Senior Olympics. Not the Senior nugget, Olympics. Not but but I, I plan to be. I hope they're my, uh, you know, my role models that I hope to be able to be doing some of the stuff they're doing. When, so when what I'm role do you play with the Senior Olympics? Um, I actually oversee the Games. Um, I'm a co-chair of the Senior Olympic Committee. It's a committee that meets all year long to plan um, and arrange all the events. Um, the exciting part about this year, not only is our 30th anniversary, but we're also going to Norfolk State this year to, to host the Games. Oh, which cool. Is awesome. So we were at the base for a while, and they were an excellent host for us for many, many years. Um, and now we've moved over to Norfolk State, and we're hoping with that venue being more centralized and having everything at one site that it's really going to increase our numbers as well. Now, once the, we have them in Norfolk, do they then, because the guy that was on the sofa last year with the 25 medals, mm -hmm. I mean, she'd been all over the country. Right, and some of them do, um, and they kind of are on their own when they go to the States. You don't necessarily really even have to win in the Norfolk Olympics to go. It's not like a qualifying, okay. um, but they can go to the state games, which is pretty much, I think it's that next week after in Newport News, so they have that option to go there, and then they can go to nationals from there. And So, yeah, it can, it can become uh, a lot of travel for them. Then you hook them up with Coach Peak, and they're <laughs> off to the Olympics. Exactly, be overseas somewhere. <laughs> That is Could so cool. Be. So, okay, tell me, the, the, the ones who've been doing it, come on, let's, we can talk behind. They didn't show up for the show. Well, they didn't. <laughs> for the ones that have been, been in, do they kind of, they come in as, with the expertise? Are they the, the ones that kind of keep the young whippersnappers in line? 
They do, and it's very, it can be very competitive, and we have the ones that you'll see, the ones that have been on the shows before that have all the medals. Um, that's their goal every year. They want to add more and more medals, and they do wear them at the games as soon as they get them, and they just keep piling them on, and that's uh, something that they always kind of look down to the ones that are just starting or to the newer ones and kind of like a prowl, you know, see what I got, and this is... Because, well, you know, this newer generation, you know, it's, it's not about winning. It's about <laughs> playing the game, you know, right? And some of them don't do it. To, some of them don't do it for the medals. They do it, to, you know, to go out there with their friends and to socialize and be a part of something, and it's not about the medals, but some of them, they come up to me even at the senior centers I see now. I'm ready for the games. I've been practicing my laps. I'm ready for the medals. You have enough medals for me. So they get really, really so excited. So you don't hang around it. people that are kind of waiting for tomorrow? No, probably not. Not in, not in our business. <laughs> They've kind of already come out. So you got to come see us. That and is then you have no choice. You know, i, I got to be candid with you. I think the seniors program that we've got is one of the best kept secrets. It is. It you is. Kind of, do they kind of just wait till they start getting to the age and then they tell them? I mean, what other kind of programs do you have going on? About the games program? or just? The seniors program, the whole seniors program that you got. Right, it's right. It's a cool program. It is, it is. It gives the seniors the opportunity to kind of do something. We kind of focus all on the rec centers with the youth and with the kids and doing things with them, but also that the seniors need that same kind of atmosphere as well, place mm -hmm. to go with their friends, place to play games, place to be healthy, um, have healthy lifestyles. And we do a, a bunch of uh, quarterly uh, or monthly um, health fairs that we do at, at some of our facilities. We invite vendors in from all over to kind of share the resources to the seniors that they wouldn't normally get if they were just at home. So there's a lot of resources out there for them. You like this, don't you? I do, I do. <laughs> you look at that smile. It's a great job. It's a great it's, job. Okay, so it's uh, May 6th through May 9th. Correct. And how do they go about signing up? Uh, the application should be online, ready to go next week. Hopefully after February 1st, after this Friday, we should have them online next week. And they can also pick them up at any other local recreation centers. Um, we have, usually have them out at churches. We'll have them out at the library. So they'll be all over. They can look forward to seeing them come out soon, and then they just mail them in. And for some of those veteran seniors, they can help hand out some of these applications and, and spread the, spread they can the wealth, right? put them out on the street and have them. Okay. <laughs> now, okay. Well, let's, we got to go. Oh, we got to go talk about uh, uh faith and the next segment but in the meanwhile tell me about this go it's been enjoyable tell me about this uh <laughs> this whole uh, mexican train thing i think i can <laughs> us. It will never break us, define us, or keep us still. Because arthritis can't beat us if we beat it first. In the fight against arthritis, you need a weapon. What's yours? Visit the Arthritis Foundation at fightarthritispain.org. Welcome back to Norfolk Perspectives. Yes, things are a little different here, and that's because Karen Jackson's on the set. Karen's a good friend who made a call about six, seven years ago and said, I got an issue and I've got a solution and I want to do something about it. And here you are. And wow, has it gotten big. Let's talk about Faith Inclusion Network. Okay. What's it all about? Well, Faith Inclusion Network is an organization. It's now a non-for-profit, 501c3. And we work with faith communities, um, disability service providers, families, individuals with disabilities, and we work to educate and network and provide educational opportunities um, to help faith communities better include people who have disabilities. Cool. And, and Karen, let's talk about that conversation we had about six, seven years ago. Uh, we were neighbors, actually. And then in right. doing the show, you said, you, you've got a, a child with special needs. And um, things right. weren't necessarily plugging in, were they? Well, yes. Um, my husband and I have a daughter, uh, Samantha, who's 15 now, believe holy it or not. <laughs> I know. And um, she has autism. And autism is the kind of disability that can really be difficult. Um, the behaviors can be difficult. So going to church for us was almost impossible mm -hmm. when she was younger. And um, I realized that we needed to find some place that would help us include her, uh, accommodate her disability and the different things associated with that. Um, 
so we ended up going over to Blessed Sacrament, and it was a great start. We got her involved re with the religious education, um, but I realized after working in advocacy at the church that there are a lot more people in this situation, that there is a whole communi community and, and, and indeed it, around the country this is an issue of how to include people who have disabilities. And so that was my idea was that we need to network with other faith communities. There was no use us just keeping all these ideas you know, to ourselves. Let's share with what everybody else was doing in the community, share our ideas, and also help educate. Um, so the idea to form this network kind of got stuck in my head, and, and that's where we started. And in 2008, we met for the first time as Faith Inclusion Network. Yeah, mm -hmm. and what, what started off as a personal quest really had a positive impact on the entire community. Now, I'm going to share with the audience why you're sitting in that chair. You're sitting in that Please. chair because you're yes. married to Scott Jackson, <laughs> who threw me out of that chair when he came on to talk about the tattoo. Because even with his story, He's using Samantha as an opportunity to really grow there, in, including children with special needs into the tattoo. That's right. That's right. We have, um, and actually Faith Inclusion Network has helped to support and share about what we call special audience night for the tattoo, where we invite people with disabilities and their family members to come and watch for free the um, kind of the dress rehearsal. So it's, you know, we've worked together on that little project to, um, to bring little that project. to our, <laughs> to bring that to the community, um, but it's great. And, and, you know, Samantha, you know, it's a, a big effect on our family, but also I think, you know, with the ideas we have to share with the the community as well. So. Well then I, I'm getting ready for the show and I know you're coming on and I always look forward to having you come on Thanks. and then I see okay well now we're talking about Hampton Roads wheelchair drive from January to March 2013. What's this got to do with Samantha and the church and here you've grown even further and hi Jeff Turner how you doing? Yeah, very well thanks. Glad you're you're joined. I'm gonna ask you on the on the air right. um, did you call or did she call you? Actually, neither. A friend of mine that I went to church <laughs> with was involved with Faith Inclusion Network, and she said, because I was retiring, looking for something to volunteer with, she goes, would you be interested in doing this? You have sort of a different bent on, you know, not being included because of restrictions of wheelchairs. And she goes, I think you'd be able to be an asset. And I didn't know Karen at the time. So when I came to the meeting, I thought, Dynamo, huh? <laughs> The ideal lady. <laughs> yeah. So one, you got the workshop coming up um, in March. Right. We have a disability conference called That All May Worship coming up March 14 and 15. And it's going to be some of it's going to be sharing stories. That's right. Our, it, yeah. That's kind of what it's really about, isn't it? Is to be able to tell your story. It it absolutely is. I really feel like um, the theme is is called sharing our stories, building our communities, and it's really about. Um, taking these stories and that's how we connect with people that's how we have relationships with people by sharing our stories and um, sharing our experiences um, so we are um, using that theme and um, using the book amazing gifts stories of faith disability inclusion the keynote speaker for Thursday night is Mark Pinsky the author of that book and he put together this book 60 something chapters of stories of people who have disabilities or being included in faith communities. Um, so he's coming from Florida, and, um, and we have other contributors from, from throughout the country coming to share their stories Thursday evening as that segment of the conference. Now, uh, Jeff, you're the treasurer of Finn, huh? Right. Well, that's sort of a Do you keep the book? <laughs> <laughs> he does. I do my best. He does. <laughs> What's your story? With with Finn or with well with Finn and with uh, being in a wheelchair. Uh, well, I was diagnosed with lupus in 1977, and then it was just some joint pain and stuff. I was working as a carpenter at the time, and uh, it's systemic, so it started you know exacerbating as time went on, and uh, developed a bunch of I, I had to get some joint replacements and things, which took me out of working in the field as a carpenter, but I went to work in the office, and then things progressed. I ended up having kidney failure, that's one of the consequences. Did dialysis for six years, got a kidney transplant in 2001 from my son, which made a world of difference. And, and then uh, was looking for something to do, you know, with my time because I was retired from disability in 98. So, I mean, it really worked well that faith inclusion came up and it's been a good fit for I me. I keep him busy. <laughs> but, but Jeff, do you realize how casual you told that story? 
-hmm. Well, it's, it's nor the norm for me. I mean, that's been 30, what, 35 or more years now. So, I mean, it's been my life, and it's nothing unusual to me. Uh, I've adapted well. I didn't, I wasn't always in the wheelchair. I wasn't in the wheelchair until about 98. Okay. And so, you know, and but there's so much technology now that it makes it simple to be able to go places, do things, you know, have a normal life, go to churches. I mean, most all faith communities now are accessible physically, mm -hmm. you know. So I mean it's it's really easy to participate. What can the viewer do? You got you got you got their attention. Okay. What, what can they do? <laughs> well, you mentioned the wheelchair drive. Um, faith Inclusion Network is helping um, partner with some local churches to um, collect wheelchairs um, and crutches and other, you know, things to help with walking. Um, we're we're trying to collect them. They eventually will get um, cleaned up and even fixed if they're broken. They can be broken, and they're going to go to eventually to impoverished countries. So it's part of uh, an organization called Johnny and Friends Ministry. Um, Finn's involvement is just helping to support that. But the last day of the drive, so the drive has already started to collect all these wheelchairs, but the last day of the drive is our, is March 15th, the day we'll be um, at the conference at Tabernacle Church. Okay, cool. So, and the conference is open to? Anyone, anyone. who wants to come. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, faith communities now starting disability ministries and programs. There might be family members, individuals who have disabilities who want to know more get more educated, people who work in the faith communities, a whole array of people. And like I told you before, a lot of people coming from outside of our area too to, to participate. Well, Karen, I got to tell you, I don't give up my chair for many people. <laughs> but you and Jeff emulate what we really are trying to strive for in Norfolk with Neighbors Building Neighborhood. Sure. It's a matter of not focusing on what got you there, but really focusing on the solution to get you forward. And I want to I want to say thank you to you all and you're welcome. Tell Scott it was the control room's idea for you to sit in that chair That's and you're right. welcome to sit in that chair whenever you come back. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. We want to hear from you what you'd like to see on TV48, but more importantly, what's going on in your neighborhood? Give us a holler at 664-6510. And as usual, it's a wonderful time to be in Norfolk just because of you and you and you. Thanks a lot.